Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We're just going to get rolling in a second here. Um, just let everybody trickle into the webinar. Um, but pleased to have everyone joining and looking forward to today's speak uh, today's talk that I'll introduce our speaker in just a moment. So thanks. Give about 10, 10 to 15 more seconds. I see the number still still going up. <laughs> How many do you anticipate? Oh, I think we're usually around 40 to 50, 50 so I think we're we're just about there. Yeah. Good. That's great. All right, well, I see it's sort of plateauing, so maybe I'll get, get us going today. So welcome everyone to, um, to today's seminar, Berman Institute of Bioethics Seminar. We're, we're really delighted to have today's speaker, I'll introduce shortly. Um, but just a few ground rules, um, as we do usually, we'll have our speaker present for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity for some questions and discussion um, we'd invite everybody to please write any questions that you might have uh, in the chat or in the Q&A as you prefer. If you have, um, we'd love to mute people so you can speak. We don't want to keep you muted, um, but you're welcome to just write in the chat. I have a question or I have a comment and we'll go ahead and take your, your, that opportunity to, to unmute you in order of, of your of appearance of the comments. So if you'd like to talk, um, please just let us know. Um, other than that, I think uh, the usual um, webinar rules would apply here. We're recording today's session, so um, just to make you aware. And I will now just introduce our speaker in today's topic. So we're delighted um, to have our colleague here from Johns Hopkins join us today, um, Dr. Roland Griffiths. Um, Dr. Griffiths is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Medicine. His, his research focuses um, both on clinical and preclinical um, laboratories and has been uh, on the behavioral and subjective effects of mood altering drugs, um, which has been supported largely by the NIH. Um, Dr. Griffiths has authored over 400 articles and book chapters. He's trained more than 50 postdocs and research fellows and been a consultant to the NIH uh, in, in, and to numerous pharmaceutical companies to develop new uh, psychotropic drugs. He's also a member of the Expert Advisory Panel on Drug Dependence for the World Health Organization. Um, he's conducted extensive research with sedative hypnotics, caffeine, and novel mood altering drugs, including in 1999, initiated a research program investigating the effects of the classic psychedelics uh, psilocybin that includes studies in healthy volunteers. Um, in the beginning and long-term mediators, um, in addition to religious theaters. So he's had a, a wide range of really interesting um, issues and interventions that he's trialed over the years. And so that's why I think we're very interested in having you join us today, uh, Dr. Griffiths, to share in your experience over your career, some of these um, sort of thorny issues and challenges, ethical challenges that you've encountered in conducting research and some of your thoughts on how we can go about navigating this going forward. So. Welcome, thank you again, Dr. Griffiths, for joining us. The um, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Joe. It's uh, a pleasure to uh, join you. Um, so what I wanna talk about is the area of psychedelic science, the therapeutic implications, and then uh, end with some of the ethical implications and, and challenges. Um, speaking of challenges, I haven't quite... <laughs> This has been an interesting uh, talk to put together. I'm accustomed to uh, presenting the, uh, the, the science, the neuropharmacology of this work. And I have a lot of that in here, but I'm gonna really go over the data portion very quickly uh, because there's just so much ground to cover. And I, and I really wanna capture kind of the big picture questions here. So, um, wait a second. For some reason, my slide's not advancing. There we go. Um, uh, just acknowledgement and disclosures. This work's been funded by 
uh, largely by philanthropic support, but some, some support from uh, the NIH. And what I'm gonna be talking about primarily is the research program at Johns Hopkins uh, Bayview, in which we're focused on psilocybin, a classic psychedelic. And in late 2019, we were gifted $17 million to establish the first and largest center for psychedelic uh, study in the United States. And, and so I'm really part of a, a very talented research team doing this work. Psilocybin is a, considered a classic psychedelic. It's a naturally occurring tryptamine alkaloid. It's the principal psychoactive component of philosophy, a genus of mushroom, the so-called magic mushrooms that have been used for centuries, if not uh, millennia, uh, uh, for religious and spiritual purposes. With respect to background, these uh, psilocybin and the other classic psychedelics are structurally diverse set of compounds. They all bind five ser uh, the five serotonin 2A receptors. They produce this unique change in uh, thoughts, perceptions, emotions, uh, and, and therein lays, lies their interest. So in addition to psilocybin, there's LSD, there's DMT, there's mescaline. A number of these drugs have been used uh, by cultures for uh, many, many years. Historically, there was a lot of interest in these compounds in the 50s and 60s, and then research with these compounds went dormant for a period of about three decades because of safety concerns raised in response to this widespread uh, non-medical use of these compounds in the 60s uh, that really um, gave a, a, a bad rap to the, uh, uh, the safety profile of these compounds, but just suppressed research for a long period of time. Currently, uh, just with respect to abuse and risks, psilocybin is the schedule one drug, so there's no medical use, but uh, there are companies now that are seeking medical approval. I'll discuss a little bit of that. Uh, it's not considered to be a drug of addiction because it doesn't produce compulsive drug-seeking behavior. Medical emergencies from psilocybin and the other classic psychedelics are very rare. Nonetheless, there's concern about adverse effects, including panic reactions and possible precipitation of enduring psychiatric conditions. With respect to the neuropharmacology, this is a very active area of research, substantial process in understanding the uh, drug and neural mechanisms underlying some of these effects of psychedelics. So just very quickly, the pocket in which the these drugs bind in the serotonin 2A receptor has been uh, identified and that's, and that's gonna allow uh, the synthesis of a variety of novel compounds of this type. We know something about what areas of brain are activated and deactivated when you give psilocybin through neuroimaging studies. We know something about brain network communication patterns that occur acutely and enduringly after psilocybin. We know something about very specific brain networks that seem to play a, a pivotal role in the psychedelic effects, in this case, the, a default mode network. Um, but, uh, but I'm gonna put aside neuropharmacology and focus on what I consider the most interesting feature of these drugs, and that is that they produce these profound alterations acutely and sometimes enduringly in consciousness. And just as a footnote, we're deeply ignorant about the nature of consciousness. There's something called the hard problem of consciousness, which, uh, which really posits uh, that we don't have, and, and many people say we can't even conceive of an explanation for how first-person experience can emerge from neurobiological systems. So in terms of our research program at Hopkins, we've done, uh, We've been doing work now for about 20 years. 
We've completed an ongoing studies in healthy participants, uh, in novice and long-term meditators. I got interested in, in this whole area because of a meditation practice. We're wrapping up a study in religious clergy. And then we have a variety of therapeutic studies uh, that I'll, I'll discuss. We looked at cancer patients and depressed patients, cigarette smokers, and we're doing studies in anorexia and Alzheimer's and about to launch a number of other studies. So we have accumulated a good bit of experience, uh, about over 375 participants, over 700 psilocybin sessions. So we're pretty confident that we know how to work with this drug and we can do so safely. I'm gonna describe some of the results from our studies with healthy participants because it's just illustrative of how we approach uh, 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 these studies, what we do in terms of administration and the kinds of results that we see in healthy volunteers are quite similar to those that we see in patient populations. So, uh, the studies that I'll describe right now are rigorous, they're blinded studies. Uh, participants are psychiatrically healthy in, in this case, so they're not patient populations. And many of these initial studies, people had no history of any psychedelic use. And we did that because we didn't want to uh, create selection bias in terms of who would participate or their expectancy sets. Um, key to um, conducting these sessions is controlling set and setting. And in this case, our participants meet with session monitors on several occasions before the first session to develop rapport and trust, which we believe minimizes the risk of adverse reactions uh, to psilocybin. Um, and then these experimental uh, conditions were designed in these studies and you'll have to take my word for it to minimize expectancy bias as best we can do that ethically given the constraints of informed consent. Studies are conducted in a comfortable living room like uh, environment. Participants uh, come in having uh, had just a very light breakfast in the morning. They take a capsule containing this uh, synthesized uh, psilocybin they're encouraged to lay on the couch throughout a, a six hour, six plus hour session, wearing eye shades and headphones through which they listen to a program of, of music. They're in the company of two guides or monitors or sitters that are there really just to provide a optimally secure environment for them they're asked to turn their attention inward on their inner experience. So this isn't a, a guided session. It's not psychotherapy as such. All we're asking them to do is go in and explore the nature of the experience and learn everything they can from that. This shows time course of monitor ratings of overall drug effects. This is from a dose effect study over the course of a six six hour sessions. And you can see they're very orderly dose and time related effects of uh, psilocybin with effects peaking at two to three hours and then dissipating over the afternoon. By the time the volunteers ready to be let go at the end of the day, they're pretty much back to normal. We release them into the custody of a friend or family member that uh, drives them home. Well, the self-reported effects of psilocybin, um, you know, have been exactly what we expected based on what we knew about psychedelic drugs. So there are perceptual changes, there are visual illusions of, of different sorts, greater emotionality, which can be joy, peace, but also fear, anxiety, it can be cognitive changes, sense of meaning, sometimes suspiciousness. But what really caught our attention when we initiated these studies 20 years ago was that in most volunteers, psilocybin produced large increases on self-rated questionnaires designed to measure naturally occurring mystical type and insightful type experiences. And this shows post-session ratings of mystical experience in a dose effect 
uh, study. So this is at the end of the session day, people complete this questionnaire. You can see we get robust dose-related increases in, uh, in ratings on this questionnaire. So what are, what are the dimensions of this questionnaire? This is, uh, these are the, there are question sets. There's a 30 item questionnaire and different questions tap these different core features of the experience. But the core feature is this sense of unity, a sense that everything is interconnected, all people, all things, all is one, pure consciousness. And that's accompanied by this sense of sacredness or reverence or preciousness of the experience. There's a noetic quality to this experience that is authoritative. There's a sense of encountering ultimate reality. And I think it's that factor one that really accounts for the, the large and enduring effects of these compounds. But also there's deeply felt positive mood, sometimes universal love, joy, transcendence of time and space, past and future collapse into the present moment. And then a hallmark feature is this sense of ineffability. People say, I can't, can't even put this experience into words. Mystical, this was a, a branding error on our part. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't play well in the scientific uh, community. So, so I have to say, just uh, for the sake uh, of uh, clarity, that mystical experience is defined by a respondent endorsing a constellation of empirically measured phenomenological dimension. The measure doesn't imply, need not imply supernatural or non-rational explanations. And if you think about it, it, it shouldn't surprise us because experiences of this type have been described from time immemorial. Uh, and they're described as rapid conversion experiences, mystical, religious peak, transcendental experiences, a transforming moment or epiphanies. Uh, as well, uh, post-session, there are increases in scales that we've developed to measure psychological insight. So people also come out of these experiences having had um, some new insight. It could be autobiographical in nature or insight into what's uh, holding them back in life or, or larger, almost philosophical kinds of uh, questions. But these, you know, this is still pretty mundane because what we're looking at here, what I've described right up to this point is what happens on a session day and what people say immediately after the session. And I've worked with lots of different psychoactive drugs and, you know, all drugs produce effects and you could, you could measure, you know, effects of this sort. What's unique and interesting is the attributions made to these experiences well after the session. So here's a month after high dose sessions and you have about 80% of people saying that that session a month ago was among the five most personally meaningful or spiritually significant experiences of their entire lifetimes. 90% are saying they attribute a sense of increased well-being, life satisfaction, or endorse uh, positive behavior mood changes to that. I'm gonna run through uh, just an array of kinds of questions that people are, uh, or, or effects that people are endorsing and attributing uh, to these experiences, just to give you a, a, a phenomenological flavor of this. But these are robust findings large effect sizes. So positive attitudes about life, people are claiming increased um, personal self-confidence, inner authority, authenticity, playfulness, open-mindedness, self-honesty, attitudes about life, increased life, appreciation, gratitude, enthusiasm, meaning, richness, joy, optimism, mood changes, increased love, open-heartedness, inner peace, positive emotions, inspiration, decreased anger, social effects, positive relationships, tolerance towards other, love towards other, empathy, compassion, concern for vulnerable people. Spirituality, increased sense of reverence 
preciousness of life, sacred experience, belief in some form of continuance after death, sense that all life is interconnected, emotional bond with humanity. People also often endorse positive behavior changes. This becomes important for, for some of the therapeutic indications, but in this case, in healthy volunteers, people spontaneously reported improved social relationships, increased physical self-care activities, or increased creative activities. That took us up to about six months. Here we are at 14 months, uh, and this is just percentage of volunteers endorsing uh, increased personal well-being and life satisfaction. And in this case, th these kinds of effects are sustained at, in the blue at 14 months at about uh, 80%. And, and that's a robust finding across a whole range of studies. The, uh, the memories and attributions to these experiences endure. So one of the questions is, are they, is this self-delusional? Are people making this up? Uh, well, it appears not because in a variety of studies now, we have queried community observers. These would be family, friends, colleagues at work and asked them relevant questions to the um, participants uh, uh, behavior or how, how they're uh, showing up in the world and in all all cases, I think we've done it in five different studies, the community observer ratings track those that are reported by the volunteers uh, themselves. And this is sustained up to 14 months. Um, one of the interesting things that is recurring in these studies and our, in our patient studies is that the mystical experience scores in particular seem to predict meaningfulness, spiritual significance, openness in personality in the healthy volunteers at follow-up, as well as predict uh, enduring therapeutic effects in our patient populations. So there is something that's being captured in this so-called mystical experience that um, seems to predict positive outcomes both therapeutic and non-therapeutic outcomes. Fear, anxiety does occur. So it, it, this is inescapable as, as well as we prepare, hold, support these. About 30% of volunteers may report at some time during high dose sessions, feelings of strong or extreme ratings of fear. Um, <clears throat> it has an unpredictable time course, but Importantly, uh, these don't result in uh, enduring decreases in sense of well-being. So these are time-limited effects that can be very, very short. Sometimes they can last most of the session. Um, but um, curiously enough, uh, many in many instances, in most instances, people uh, report even the difficult portions of these experiences are of value. Okay, I'm gonna run through some therapeutic applications just to show where this is going therapeutically. Uh, so we've done trials in cancer patients, major depression and cigarette smoking. This is uh, cancer patients. Uh, this is depressed uh, mood uh, rated uh, uh, by uh, uh, the HAMD, which is a gold standard clinical measure of, uh, of depression. And what's shown here is uh, a, a study in which there were two different groups, the green and the orange, um, that received either a low dose of psilocybin or a high dose of psilocybin. And you can see in the orange, you have high rates of clinically significant improvement that has at the drop of 50% on the HAMD, and that's sustained out to six months. And likewise, remission to normal range is 60% in five weeks in the, in the high dose group and 71% in, uh, at, uh, in this case, six months. 
we just recently published a study in JAMA Psychiatry looking at psilocybin treatment of major depressive disorder, huge effect sizes. This is, again, this is uh, the grid HAMD, uh, huge decreases, and we're working up the uh, follow-up data. This is out to eight weeks. We've gone out to a year. We're still seeing uh, very large uh, treatment effects. We've also looked at uh, uh, cigarette uh, uh, addictions. And in this case, the addiction that we started wor with was cigarette smoking cessation in which we married the psilocybin intervention to a structured program. It's a cognitive behavior program to quit uh, smoking. And this uh, graphic shows urinary codeine, which is a measure of exposure to nicotine uh, at baseline prior to uh, administration of, uh, of psilocybin. And then you hit the target quit date, which corresponds to the first uh, exposure to psilocybin. And you can see this is median. Uh, urinary codeine drops down to zero. At six months, we had 80% abstinence rates. This was a, um, just a pilot study uh, unblinded in 15 smokers, but uh, nonetheless, 80% abstinence in smokers is unheard of in the smoking field. And, and we're doing a further comparative efficacy study now. So that's a, that's a snapshot of the, uh, of, of the human administration stuff. I now want to turn to uh, some uh, interesting observations we've made through survey studies. So we've, we've really made effective use of anonymous survey studies, tapping into a community of people who are willing and interested in reporting back uh, experiences that they've had on psychedelics. And uh, we've conducted a, a number of these. And, I, and what I'm going to talk about is the latter two entity or uh, yeah, the God encounter experiences and entity encounter experiences after uh, DMT. Um, because I think what they do is they illustrate uh, what I'm uh, contemplating as, as being a, a, a potentially, well, it's a very important underlying mechanism of how, uh, how these experiences change and alter behavior, uh, and it and, and surely has important ethical uh, implications. Um, so this, this first study, we asked people, have you ever had a personal encounter with God or higher power? Uh, and survey respondents had to endorse having had this experience, and, and they could label it God or higher power or ultimate reality or emissary of God, but they had to say, yeah, I've had that kind of experience. And here we targeted two groups, one who uh, had had such an experience after psilocybin. We actually have done this with LSD, DMT, and ayahuasca as well, but just for clarity, I'm going to just focus in on the psilocybin group. And, and those groups are much more similar than different. And then we had another group of uh, these are non-drug, naturally occurring God encounter experiences among uh, people who, for whatever reason, under whatever conditions, had such an experience, but had never taken a psychedelic before. So, um, uh, there, and you can see our sample size here is pretty large. We have over a thousand psilocybin participants about 800 non-drug participants. And this is just showing that there's some demographic differences, probably not surprisingly, in these groups. And here we asked, did you have an intention to have such an encounter? And, and that's pretty low. It's you know around 20% at, at best. Here's the descriptor of that that was encountered. And so here we have a significant difference between these two groups. So the non-drug group was more likely to say, you know, the best descriptor of what I encountered is God 
are an emissary of God. 60% endorse that. That's significantly higher than the drug group. And the psilocybin group it was flipped. It was about 60% said, you know, the best descriptor I have is ultimate reality. So we have these demographic differences. We have differences in the best descriptor, but this becomes kind of interesting. So this was asking them, what are the attributions to that that was encountered? And you can see these match up really well. And, uh, and yeah, it's just <laughs> fascinating to me. So they're, they're endorsing at high rates that what they encountered, whether or not they called it God or ultimate reality or higher power for that matter, was intelligent, it was sacred, it was benevolent, it was eternal, it was conscious, it was not malicious, and it was not negatively judgmental. Their memory of the encounter, uh, this is endorsing, was this experience more real than everyday reality? And, and you had to see, see about 70% saying, yes, it was. And that's, you know, that's one of those defining characteristics of the mystical experience, that noetic quality of being more real than real. Uh, they scored high on the mystical experience questionnaire when asked to reflect on the experience. They have make strong attributions of positive effects to these experiences being uh, spiritually significant, personally meaningful, psychologically insightful. Uh, and, you know, this is again, similar to our laboratory studies. Interestingly, uh, uh, when you look at the subgroup of atheists, uh, so identification of atheists before the encounter was more, uh, was more common in the psilocybin group than the non-drug group, but probably not surprisingly. But after the encounter, the majority of these atheists in both groups no longer identified as atheists. So about 57, 67% of the psilocybin and non-drug groups uh, suggested that uh, uh, no longer identified as atheists. And that really suggests that these are in effect conversion experiences for the majority of atheists. So the conclusions here are these data suggest psilocybin occasion experiences of the divine or God encounters may represent a model system for understanding naturally occurring uh, experiences of this sort. So I'm gonna now turn to a different survey. And this was done uh, probing in on this kind of interesting phenomena that people report after smoking DMT and so DMT is another classic psychedelic. It's a very short acting compound when inhaled. Uh, it's a longer acting compound when taken uh, in combination with some metabolic uh, inhibitors. And that's what occurs in ayahuasca use in South America, which has been, is, is widely used. But this is uh, asking people about entity encounter experiences. Um, Rick Straussman back in the 60s did some studies on DMT and ultimately stopped them because so many of his volunteers started reporting entity encounter experiences and it kind of freaked Rick Straussman out. Uh, and, uh, and so he dropped that line of research. So we were really curious about characterizing the phenomenology of these experiences. And, uh, and, and trying to get a handhold on that. Um, and, and frankly, I, we went into this thinking that they were something other than anything else that we have looked at. And as, as you'll see, they're not. They're actually quite similar to what we get with psilocybin, but we failed it to ask some of the same kinds of questions. So this is a large sample. This is 2,500 people. Um, uh, about 37% college educated, 70% what they're doing is reporting on their first uh, uh, DMT uh, entity encounter experience. So uh, intention to have this experience, 21%, that was similar to the God encounter survey. So most went in taking the DMT, not expecting this. 
They had a variety of senses uh, involved, vision, extrasensory, hearing, and touch. And 85% reported having communicated with this entity. Uh, this is that question, was the experience more real than everyday waking consciousness? 81% uh, said during the experience, even after the experience, 65% said yes, it was. Does the, did the entity continue to exist after the encounter? Uh, so this is <laughs> what, I, what I'm edging into here is ontological shock. So 72% uh, endorse that there, it's their belief that this entity continues to exist after the encounter. It's not, it's not just a drug experience in their head. There's something definitive about this. And how about this next one? The experience altered their fundamental conception of reality, 80%. With 60% saying it was desirable, 1% saying it was undesirable. Here's the attributions to that that was encountered. And what's striking here is how this lines up with the God encounter uh, survey. So uh, in spite of the fact that they weren't labeling this uh, God. The entity showed up in, in all kinds of different <laughs> packages and forms, uh, um, you know, insectoids or, uh, uh, you know, or just clown-like uh, features or, I don't know, you know, sentient, um, sentient triangles. I mean, it, it, it can be virtually anything, spirit being. But uh, here they're endorsing that at high rates, it was conscious, intelligent, benevolent, sacred, had agency in the world, was positively judgmental, eternal, all-knowing. And again, very low on negatively judgmental or malicious. And here we have the atheist religious identification stuff. So identification of atheists before and after the experience drops significantly from 28% to 10%. Identification of agnostic drops from 27 to 16%. Identification as believing in ultimate reality, higher power, God, or universal divinity uh, increases to about 60% from 36%. So we're really seeing fun fundamental changes in, or in life orientation. And here, uh, these are um, uh, these are percentage uh, rating positive desirable changes across a whole range of measures. So this actually looks like our psilocybin kind of work. So the conclusion here, DMT occasion entity encounters may have many similarities to non-drug entity encounter experiences, such as those described in religious uh, in religious circumstances, alien abduction experiences, near-death contacts. We're actually doing a whole other survey right now on near-death, naturally occurring near-death experiences and psychedelic uh, occasion experiences of that sort. Aspects of the experience and its interpretation produce profound and enduring ontological changes in worldview. And such profound changes in ontological worldview might be regarded as important insights by some, but could be alarming to others because they may lead to overt physical or psychological harm, or because they might be viewed as resulting in epistemic harm of, uh, of taking the individual further away from the truth of reality, depending on how you define truth. So the conclusions, uh, uh, the kind of larger conclusions of, of these studies now, uh, in particular to the laboratory studies, are that under the conditions that we're running these psilocybin studies, uh, psilocybin can occasion experiences having marked similarities to classic mystical and insightful experiences. And these experiences are associated with enduring positive trait changes in attitudes, moods, behavior in both healthy and patient populations. The finding that psilocybin can occasion in most people studied 
mystical and insightful experiences virtually identical to those that occur naturally suggests that such experiences are biologically normal. That is, we're, we're wired to have such experiences. And now these experiences, and this is the excitement for science uh, uh, and medical science, it now these kinds of experiences and their determinants and consequences are amenable to systematic prospective scientific study. And that's been elusive up to this point because these experiences did occur naturally, but uh, they, uh, they didn't occur predictably and, and not in a fashion you could do prospective research. And so with that, a whole range of fascinating scientific questions uh, open up. So in biological psychiatry, how do factors like personality, genetics, personal intention affect such the likelihood of such experiences? Neuroscience, what structural functional changes account for these experiences? Behavioral, what behaviors have changed? What behavioral mechanisms underlie this? Therapeutic applications are super important. Are they therapeutically useful? And there does appear to be this transdiagnostic applicability across a range of measures. And we have two companies now that are seeking uh, uh, to launch phase three clinical trials of psilocybin and treatment of depression. And, I, and it would be my guess that that's just the beginning of what's gonna happen in terms of psychedelic science and affecting, uh, and affecting a variety of psychiatric and behavioral conditions. As well, uh, research may cast, uh, re have really interesting implications on altruism and pro-social behavior. Uh, so the extent to which these experiences underwrite a sense of interconnectedness of all people and things. There arises this pro-social impulse and that comes out strongly in the, uh, in the outcome measures. And, and so to understand the underpinnings of that is critical. And then uh, closely related to that, spirituality and religion, what are the similarities and differences between these psychedelic occasion experiences and naturally occurring? religious experiences and and you know how are such experiences interpreted by those who are committed to different faith traditions what are the implications for promoting spirituality and and, uh, and pro-social behavior and ultimately ethics so ethical considerations and i just wanted to end on this to throw it open to discussions so there are risks to participants in such studies, of course. So, you know, number one is the risk of the potential for enduring psychotic process, schizophrenia. Um, and, uh, and, we, and that's at very low rates, but uh, we go into this research assuming that to be uh, a, a potential possible outcome. And, and so we screen people very carefully with respect to family uh, histories or, or predispositional traits toward uh, psychosis. Uh, but nonetheless, that's a, a significant risk. The, bit, the most probable risk is that people are gonna engage in dangerous behavior. Now, we control that strongly within the way we do this research because we're developing this trust relationship with them. They're coming into our session room. We have them, uh, we tuck them into the couch. We, uh, we ha have them take their shoes off and we give them slippers and take their wallet and their cell phone and put them, put them elsewhere. Uh, you know, so we're cocooning them. But when these drugs are given under other conditions, particularly uh, recreationally, uh, uh, you know, then that's where people can end up engaging in dangerous behavior, putting themselves or others at risk of harm and even, even death. And then a, a lower uh, level risk is hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder. Some people 
who've used these drugs quite a bit report something going awry in their visual processing system. But, um, but relevant particularly to the God Encounter Survey and the uh, DMT survey is uh, because th those underscore this better than anything else I have, is the potential harmful effects of ontological shock. Um, let's see, where do I have this? Oh, here. So effects of ontological shock. So these are the worldview changes, shifts in belief about the nature of reality. And, uh, and actually what I need to say is there are both potential, very significant risks to this, as well as potential benefits. So, you know, to the individual, the potential for destabilizing mental health and social relationships uh, is there. And we can, we can talk about it, but if, but if you give um, uh, uh, yeah, if, if there's a, a total rewriting of your understanding of the nature of reality or, or whether or not you believe in spirit entities, uh, you, you can ship your uh, entire social structure and, and that, could be, uh, that could be harmful and might be beneficial. There are, risks, uh, there are also risks and benefits to culture and society at large. And so I often reflect on when I start thinking about the, the remarkable worldview changes that occur with psychedelics, you know, you have to recognize that that can be very destabilizing to existing cultural institutions. And it may be the case that that's why psychedelics that have been incorporated into societies uh, ultimately get shut down. You know, what happened in the 1960s was, uh, uh, was I think, a, a perceived threat to existing cultural institutions, and they snuffed out the use. And if you look historically, that's happened in different cultures over time with psychedelics. So I think we, we actually need to think about that. And interactive with that is this last point, the role of seven setting as a determinant of such effects has deeply profound implications. So it's often given that set and setting are important determinants of psychedelic effects. It, it's, been, it's not well studied, but those of us working in this area I think take it uh, as a as a given, but if you take that as a as a given, uh, you know then then by administering these uh, compounds, you're putting incredible power in the hands of those that are setting the set and setting context up, and so there's all the difference in the world between taking uh, psilocybin in our laboratory at Hopkins, you know, if you're a depressed patient, uh, given our framing of this and going to South America with a shaman who, who believes in spirit worlds and a, an entirely different ontological framework and, and, you, <laughs> and you immerse yourself in seven ayahuasca sessions over a period of nine days. <laughs> And people can come out entirely changed, and and no longer, <laughs> no longer uh, um, connecting with the the way our conventional worldview works here in our culture. And this has important implications for approval of medical use. Under what are the constraints? What are the boundary areas? What guardrails are put up over those seven setting conditions? And then legalization initiatives like is going on in Oregon, uh, same kind of thing. So that's it. I, I ran a little bit over. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Roland. Um, I think you have many of us questioning reality now, but we'll, we'll try to make it through at least, at least some questions over the next 10 minutes. And um, I'm not sure we'll be able to get to all of them. We've had a number come in. Um, but let me just start with one that's asking for a quick clarification, and then we can get into some of the substantive questions here. I think 
there's a question about on your graphs that you presented, I believe maybe about a third of the way in or a quarter of the way in your talk. Um, the question is whether zero is implying that they got a placebo. And it's, if so, it seemed like some placebo effects lasted for six months. And folks were curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah. So um, let's see. So different studies were done in different ways. And uh, as, as I mentioned, we what we tried to do is um, minimize expectancy effects. Uh, and in doing so, we actually tried to, to maximize expectancy bias. So some of those studies, people were told that they could receive that, for instance, our, our cancer study, they were told you're gonna to come in, you are gonna receive a dose of psilocybin and that dose could vary between you know, a low dose to a high dose to an intermediate dose. What they didn't know is that it would either be an absolutely trivial dose or a relatively high dose. So we, we really randomized to a placebo-like condition, but we did so under conditions in which they had full expectancy effects. And, and furthermore, the guides who ran that study had that same understanding and the same expectancy. So we wait, we waited this to maximize the chance of producing effects. And then remember, our sudden setting conditions are set up to optimize these kinds of effects. I mean, people are saying, you know, go in, you're getting psilocybin, get everything you can out of this experience. So under these conditions, we actually ran one study with methylphenidate. You know, we had two people get methylphenidate and have full mystical experiences. Uh, and, um, and that, that, that in my mind is exactly the way it should be. I mean, we know that these experiences can occur naturally. If you put the gain up and you get the right circumstances, you're going to get very positive effects. So that's why we have apparently large placebo effects. Can I maybe just follow up on that, building on, I think, a question here in the chat from Kevin about um, asking a bit more about your informed consent process. It sounds like that's a bit complicated for your studies. So could you say a bit more about that? And, and yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> it's a qu question I think, I think I should be asking you. What, how, how, how do you inform people? of a worldview change, that their whole sense of reality may be altered. And, you know, and it's, so if you look at our consent forms, that's what we tell them. Uh, and we go through that and we explain that as, as, best, as best we can. All the words are there. Uh, but, you know, but having an experience is very different than being told about an experience. And so one of the striking features to me is in talking to volunteers at the end of the session, uh, they'll very often say, you know, I was expecting this or that, or you told me this, but I didn't know it was going to be like that. <laughs> it's like, and it's no matter what you say, you, you, you can't explain. So we do everything we can to explain those effects. We uh, describe the negative as well as the positive. We try not to bias people to think that they're gonna have uh, uh, positive effects. Um, but nonetheless, there's a, there's a strong skewing of all this data towards something that's very uh, benevolent, and that, and that's, and and that's interesting. Now, that may be because of the sudden setting that we set up, or maybe that there are some dispositional characteristics for how we're put together that makes that to be true. Yeah, Kevin, do you want to you want to maybe follow up on that? I'm not sure if you. Yes, like yeah. actually. So, I was wondering. Is there any sort of negotiation that occurs between guide and 
participant as to what the guy should do if X, Y, or Z happens and how the guy can best respect the participant boundaries. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a great question. And and yes, uh, we have extensive discussions about what the expectation is during the session, how we will support them, and certainly and certainly the boundary uh, uh, conditions un under which we we can and and, and will support them and and, and how we're going to uh, behave with respect to that. I, that's that's absolutely critical to the uh, preparation. These experiences to open up such a sense of vulnerability uh, that it, uh, in my view, is, is critical that people feel safe and held. And, and what I see that we're trying to do is create a, con a safety container for people to have this experience in which they, you know, these are often described as, um, you know, uh, dissolving of self or death-like experiences where every, everything they know about themselves starts to uh, dis dissolve. The fabric of reality starts to change. And so you can imagine that that could be hugely terrifying. And so we have extensive discussions about that. And, and we won't proceed if the volunteer does not feel comfortable and and safe in, in the in the company of the uh, of the therapist. So I think we have time maybe for one more question. I'll try to combine a few here if possible, but I think um, there's a question about broader sort of policy application uh, policy around this. Um, and I, you know whether you'd be in favor of rescheduling, um, so Cybin, for example, recreational use. There's, there's also, I think, in, in your, in your presentation, you mentioned that there are these potential significant risks, particularly if, um, you know, administered outside of a controlled environment and those sorts of things. So, um, question also about whether, you know, that those risks have materialized in your research context, and, and if sort of mashing those together, but it seems like they're related in terms of what you might think would be the future of this in, in the wider applications. Yeah, um, let's see, well, as I said, I, I think they're, these are really important questions and I don't think they have been unpacked uh, to the degree that they actually need, need to be. Um, so, uh, you know, FDA is going about uh, approving phase three clinical trials and they're, you know, they're setting up uh, conditions for therapist training, for instance, uh, you know, but there's, uh, there has to be some deep thought about what the, you know, what, what is the worldview <laughs> that the therapist holds? What's the worldview that the participant holds? And how, how do we respect those? Uh, how do we respect those boundaries? Um, it becomes much more problematic as, as you go to legalization um, and, and decriminalization because, uh, you know, so Oregon has just passed a, a effectively a, a therapeutic amendment that will allow psilocybin to be given by a variety of therapists. They haven't worked out what kind of therapy training people have, but, um, if some of these people come with training in a South American shamanistic tradition, you know, like our, <laughs> like the QAnon shaman uh, who showed up at the Capitol, you know, heaven help us. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's serious stuff because if, if set and setting are important and we have the, and we open up people to, 
significant worldview changes, then uh, then that's going to be really critical. So I, I'm I'm concerned actually about the legalization decriminalization initiatives. I, I think we need to be moving slowly on that. We need to actually develop the structures the the structures around use of these compounds that are going to minimize risk to the individual and to culture at large. Well, I hate, I hate to cut the conversation off, but I know we're at the top of the hour here and there are a number of additional questions in the chat and in the Q&A. Maybe we can uh, capture them somehow and share them with you afterwards if you have time to consider. But, um, but I just want to thank you again for, for joining us today and for sharing this um, this really interesting work that you've been doing over your career and, and I think raises a lot of interesting questions that we only scratch the surface of here. But, um, but thank you again. And to, to the participants, just uh, flag that our next seminar is on March 22nd um, with Barbara Evans at University of Florida Law. And um, she'll be speaking on rules for robots and why uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning medical software breaks them. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you'll be able to join again uh, on March 22nd. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>